as I am sure you know, history exams are not just about memorising facts. They're about understanding broader themes, analysing sources and writing well-structured thoughtful responses. So to support your preparation for AQA GCSE History Paper 2, we've used past exam trends and examiner reports to predict which topics are most likely to appear in 2025. They are a helpful focus for your revision, but remember AQA can ask questions from any part of the syllabus, so do make sure you revise all topics thoroughly. To help with your preparation, our predicted papers include full exam style questions uh, that you can use to practice under timed conditions, just like in the real exam. Each set comes with detailed mark schemes to help you self-assess and improve your technique. Brand new for 2025 as well, we've also included free video walkthroughs these are led by experienced history teachers and show you how to interpret questions, structure your answers effectively and avoid common mistakes. Now, as we move into each of the topics we offer this year, make sure to use the timestamps to go to your relevant bit. We've got predicted topics for health and the people, Norman England and Elizabethan England. So do skip to the section relevant to you. OK, so we're going to start with health and the people circa 1000 to the present day. Now, one topic we've predicted to appear on this year's paper is surgery in the 19th century. At the beginning of this century, the surgery was incredibly dangerous. Patients often died from pain, infection or blood loss. Anaesthetics had not yet really been developed and the shock of surgery could be fatal. There was little understanding of infection and surgeons rarely washed their hands or sterilise their tools. Blood transfusions were not yet in use, so excessive bleeding was often deadly. Key breakthroughs started to transform surgical practice. In 1846, ether was introduced as an anaesthetic, although it irritated the lungs. In 1847, James Simpson discovered chloroform, which made surgery far less painful. However, some surgeons resisted its use, believing pain helped patients recover. In 1865, Joseph Lister began using carbolic acid to clean wounds and instruments, dramatically reducing infection rates. By 1900, surgery had become aseptic. Surgeons wore gloves, operated in sterilised environments and worked in cleaner hospitals. These developments made surgery far safer, but acceptance took time and change was gradual. Another important area is the discovery and development of penicillin, one of the most significant medical advances of the 20th century. In 1928, Alexander Fleming observed that a mould, later identified as penicillin, could kill bacteria. Although he published his findings, he did not take the discovery further. In the late 30s and early 40s, scientists Howard Florey and Ernst Chain built on Fleming's work. They developed ways to test and produce penicillin in larger quantities. With financial support from the United States during the Second World War, they were able to scale up production. And by 1945, penicillin had saved thousands of soldiers from infections. Penicillin became the first widely used antibiotic and paved the way for the development of many more. It transformed the treatment of bacterial diseases such as pneumonia and syphilis. However, in recent years, antibiotic resistance has become a growing concern, limiting the effectiveness of these once life-saving drugs. Okay, next here, the exam may focus also on the similarities between medieval and Renaissance approaches to disease and treatment. In both periods, people believed in the theory of the four humours, blood, phlegm, yellow, bile and black bile. The miasma theory, which suggested that disease was caused by bad air, remained popular. Religion continued to shape people's understanding of illness, with many still believing that disease was a punishment from God. Herbal remedies were widely used in both periods and treatments such as bleeding, purging and prayer remained common. However, there were some important developments in the Renaissance. Doctors like Vesalius began to challenge old ideas, particularly those of Galen. The invention of the printing press in 1440 helped spread new medical knowledge more quickly and dissection of human bodies became more frequent, allowing doctors to gain a better understanding of anatomy. Despite these changes, many older beliefs remained deeply rooted and progress was relatively slow. A fourth area worth revising is the role of communication in the development of medical knowledge from circa 1000 to the present day. The invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in the 15th century revolutionised the way information was shared. 
for the first time, books could be mass produced and distributed widely, which helped spread the work of figures like Vesalius. In the 17th and 18th centuries, scientific journals and letters allow physicians and scientists such as William Harvey and Edward Jenner to share discoveries with one another. The founding of the Royal Society in 1660 played a key role in encouraging scientific debates and sharing ideas. Public health campaigns became more common in the 19th and 20th centuries. So, for example, germ theory, published in 1861, gained traction through education and mass communication. Governments began using posters and newspapers to raise awareness about hygiene and sanitation. In the modern era, communication has become even faster. The internet, television and social media now allow medical advice and information to be shared globally in seconds. The rapid development and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines was made possible by this level of global collaboration and communication. Faster, more effective communication has played a key role in accelerating medical progress throughout history. Okay, those are our topics for health and the people. We're now going to move on to Norman England circa 1066 to 1100. Of course, while these topics are based on previous trends and patterns, it's important to revise the full specification to be fully prepared for any question that may appear in the exam. Now, one key area that may come up is the reign of William II, also known as William Rufus, who ruled from 1087 to 1100. He was the son of William the Conqueror and inherited the English crown after his father's death. His nickname, Rufus, came from his red hair. William II faced significant challenges during his reign. There were multiple revolts by Norman barons, many of whom would have preferred his brother Robert to take the throne. He also clashed with the church, particularly with Archbishop Anselm, as the two often disagreed over church authority and reform. Another major challenge was his effort to control Normandy, which involved direct conflict with his brother. William II died under mysterious circumstances while hunting in 1100. Some historians suspect it may have been an assassination, potentially orchestrated to benefit his younger brother, Henry, who succeeded him. His reign is important because it highlights the ongoing difficulty of controlling both England and Normandy at the same time. Another major area of focus is the series of revolts against Norman rule between 1067 and 1075. These rebellions occurred for several reasons. The Normans imposed heavy taxes, seized land from Anglo-Saxon nobles and imposed harsh military control, including the widespread construction of castles, which angered the English population. The first major uprising came in 1067, led by Edric the Wild. Although unsuccessful, it demonstrated early unrest. In 1068, Edwin and Morcar, once supporters of William, led another failed revolt, but their actions signalled that discontent was growing. The most devastating event followed in 1069 and 1070 during the harrying of the North. In response to continued rebellion, William devastated large areas of northern England, destroying homes, animals and crops. It's estimated that up to 100,000 people died as a result of starvation and exposure. Now, finally, in 1075, the revolt of the Earl showed that opposition was not limited to Anglo-Saxons. This rebellion involved Norman lords too. Although it was quickly suppressed, it was another indication of the fragility of Norman control. William's brutal responses to these uprisings, though effective, highlighted the extent of resistance he faced in consolidating power. A related topic is the changes in land holding under the Normans, which were designed to solidify control. William replaced almost all Anglo-Saxon lords with loyal Norman barons. Land was distributed as a reward for service and support, and the feudal system was introduced to structure society. Under this system, all land officially belonged to the king. In return for loyalty and service, barons and bishops were granted large estates. These barons then provided land to knights, who in turn offered military service. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the peasants who worked the land. Now, this structure ensured loyalty, strengthened William's rule and made tax collection more efficient. However, it also made life very difficult for the lower classes who had little freedom or ownership. Now, another predicted topic here is the Norman approach to religious architecture, particularly cathedrals with a focus on Durham Cathedral. The Normans built grand cathedrals, not only as places of worship, but as symbols of their authority. These buildings replaced earlier Anglo-Saxon churches and were deliberately impressive in scale and design to project Norman power. 
Durham Cathedral, constructed between 1093 and 1133, was a key example. It was built in honour of St Cuthbert, a well-known Anglo-Saxon saint, and was strategically located on high ground to dominate the surrounding area. Architecturally, it was significant for being the first building in the world to use ribbed vaults, marking a major development in medieval construction. Beyond its religious function, Durham Cathedral served as a bold visual statement of Norman dominance in the north of England. Okay, those are our predicted topics for AQA GCSE History Paper 2, Norman England. Again, we really hope these are a useful starting point to guide your revision. Let's now move on to the last topic we've provided, predictions for for Paper 2 this year, Elizabethan England, circa 1568 to 1603. This slide presents some of the key topics predicted for AQA GCSE History Paper 2, Elizabethan England. These predictions are based on patterns from previous exam series, but obviously it's essential to revise the entire specification to ensure you're fully prepared for any question that may come up. Now, one likely focus is the Northern Rebellion of 1569, a significant uprising against Queen Elizabeth I. This revolt was led by Catholic nobles, including the Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, who hoped to replace Elizabeth with Mary, Queen of Scots. The rebellion was driven by several factors. Religious tension played a central role as the rebel leaders were Catholics, who opposed Elizabeth's Protestant rule. Additionally, many Northern nobles felt they had lost influence and power under her reign. The presence of Mary, Queen of Scots, provided an alternative kind of monarch who aligned with their faith and interests. The rebels managed to capture Durham, where they held a Catholic mass as a symbolic act of defiance. However, Elizabeth's response was swift and decisive. Her army crushed the rebellion and over 450 rebels were executed as a warning to others. Although the revolt failed, it demonstrated the ongoing threat posed by Catholic opposition within England. At the same time, it reinforced Elizabeth's strength as a ruler who could suppress internal unrest with authority. Another important area of study is poverty in Elizabethan England. Several economic and social factors contribute to the rise in poverty during this period. Bad harvests led to food shortages and inflation, while the collapse of the cloth trade caused widespread unemployment. A growing population placed further strain on food supplies and the job market, and rising prices made it difficult for wages to keep up. Elizabeth's government attempted to address the issue through a series of poor laws passed in 1597 and 1601. These laws distinguished between the deserving poor, those unable to work, such as the elderly or sick, and the undeserving poor, who were able to work but chose not to. The former were given assistance, often through almshouses, while the latter faced punishment, such as time in workhouses or correction houses. Although these measures showed a growing awareness of social responsibility, poverty remained a widespread and persistent problem throughout Elizabeth's reign. Now, the changing relationship between England and Spain is another predicted topic, especially given its role in international conflict and religious division. Tensions between the two nations were rooted in several causes. Religion was a major factor. England was Protestant, while Spain was staunchly Catholic. Spain's support for Mary, Queen of Scots, made matters worse, as she was seen as a legitimate Catholic alternative to Elizabeth. Furthermore, English sailors, including figures like Sir Francis Drake, engaged in piracy, attacking Spanish ships and stealing treasure. England's support for Protestant rebels in the Netherlands further deepened the hostility. These tensions culminated in the Spanish Armada of 1588 when Spain launched a fleet of 130 ships in an attempt to invade England. The English Navy, led by commanders such as Drake and Hawkins, used fire ships to scatter the Armada and a violent storm dealt a final blow to the Spanish fleet. The defeat of the Armada was a turning point for Elizabethan England. It boosted national pride, enhanced Elizabeth's prestige and marked the beginning of England's rise as a dominant naval power. Okay, finally, the Historic Environment Study on Hardwick Hall offers insight into the design and purpose of Elizabethan country houses. Unlike medieval castles, which were built primarily for defence, Elizabethan country houses were constructed to display wealth, power and Renaissance aesthetics. The political stability of Elizabeth's reign meant there were less need for fortification, allowing the aristocracy to focus on luxury. Hardwick Hall, built in the 1590s and owned by Bess of Hardwick, is a prime example. Bess was one of the wealthiest women in England 
and her home reflected her status. The house was famous for its extensive use of glass, so much so that it earned the nickname Hardwick Hall more glass than wall. With its enormous windows, elaborate design and open gardens, the house was intended to impress and reflect the cultural values of the Elizabethan elite. It symbolised a shift from medieval austerity to a new focus on luxury, refinement and architectural innovation. Right then, those are all three of the topics we have predictions for for your 2025 GCSE AQA History Paper 2 exam. We really hope they help to guide your revision. You're doing great. Keep up the hard work now and we promise it will be worth it in August.